it has happened. Um, and this is the first time in a harassis context we've had an opportunity to talk through uh, things once um, we're, we're the other side, as it were. Um, so I'm going to welcome you all as our, as our panel um, with um, some uh, very rough introductions. I'm going to ask each of us to introduce ourselves um, and uh, perhaps just explain sort of how you've come to be here. And I'm not going to try and sort of do that. Uh, I, I, I do know who you are, but I'm going to each let everybody do that for themselves because I'd rather not offend by getting it wrong. Um, so uh, with that, we can then, let's say, take an order, um, offer three, four minutes of thoughts around the topic. I thought Mohammed, in his sort of preparations was, was quite rightly looking at sort of the background and sort of the past and the, the you know, how we got to where, we, we, where we, we, we've got to where we are. I'm much more interested in where we go to from here, and I, I, you know, I don't know whether we might all want to talk a bit about that as well, but um, I, I'm going to sort of suggest an order. Um, uh, uh, I pass to Susan, then to Eve, uh, uh, to Hugo, to Sir Peter, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of come up in the sort of, uh, in, in, you know, in the rear. Um, uh, after uh, after you all have, have offered your your thoughts, but um, uh, Baroness Susan Kramer, um, you, you know, that's a, a minimalist introduction, but I'm afraid that's the one I'm going to give you today. So please, yeah, uh, over to you. Uh, well, uh, Susan Kramer, I, I, I'm a member of the House of Lords, and I have to explain I'm a Liberal Democrat, so I'm not one of the two parties that is likely in the near future to form government in the United Kingdom, so you must you must make your conclusions as a consequence. Uh, my party was very much fundamentally opposed to Brexit. We were a main party, and once we accepted that there was no choice, Brexit had happened, we would still like the UK to be as close as possible uh, uh, to to Europe. Um, do you want me to make my three or four minute comments now? Yeah. Let's, let's do it that way, and then I, I've, I've got the order in mind, so I can. So, um, uh, uh, um, I mean, by background, I'm a banker. For anyone who's interested, uh, it's, uh, um, I, I have been both a member of Parliament and uh, uh, and a Minister of State in the Department for Transport. But uh, um, I now speak largely on Treasury issues. So I, I think even I mean, we have gone for a fairly extreme version of Brexit. I think I think many people thought that uh, even Brexiteers that you know we would leave the European Union, but we would end up somewhere between a third country and a member, and that really isn't true. I think we're very definitely now in the third country ranks. That uh, we've not only left the uh, uh, the single market and the customs area, but uh, we are basically constantly talking the language of diversion and sovereignty and carving our own path. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, I don't think there's much evidence of a cooperative relationship uh, developing with the EU, certainly at this point in time. Um, if anything, it's, it's resolved itself into a confrontational relationship, which pleases populist voters and greatly worries me. So I think we're in a fairly critical period. There are many unanswered questions about the relationship with the EU. I particularly focus on financial services. And of course, the, those issues have not been resolved and what access our financial services will have to the, Europe, the EU market have not been resolved. And I don't think the language of confrontation is helping. I sit on a number of committees, so I'm very conscious that there are quite a number of Brexiteers who say basically we shouldn't be thinking of the EU as a key market anymore. Uh, so we have the whole world at, uh, at, at our beck and call crying out for our services and that's where our future lies. I raise some real questions about how easy that is. But, uh, you've probably seen stories, our first month of trading post our formal departure has been appalling in the collapse of exports and of imports. Um, but uh, um, uh, I accept some of that will be teething problems, some of that is COVID. But to give you an idea of what kind of impact this is happening on some sectors, that's uh, just a one month loss of food exports that would require is equivalent to five years worth of food exports.
So at this point in time, um, I am I, I am extremely concerned. Certainly, all of the impact is uh, COVID provides cover. Uh, to what extent it's intertwined with COVID is hard to see. But we certainly anecdotally are getting a lot of reports of particularly small businesses saying that they're simply going to drop out of exporting altogether and look for other opportunities in the domestic market. And those kinds of changes, if they become fixed and fundamental, worry me hugely. Thank you very much. And it's your um, going assumption that there won't be financial services equivalents. That's my um, right? assumption is that there won't be financial services yeah. equivalent. And we heard the Commissioner, uh, Mairead McGuinness, talk about, you know, areas where we do have at least uh, temporary equivalents, such as in clearing. And clearly she would make it an argument around financial stability. But of course, it's much more than that. But uh, I, I think we will see this. Uh, to me, the EU sits in the catbird seat here. It can give equivalents where it wants to, it can give equivalents for as long as it wants to. And essentially, there is no potential for the EU, for the UK to retaliate in any way, because it would only be cutting off its nose to spite its face. So uh, um, uh, 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 I, I am concerned, and, and, and it's the pace of diminution that worries me. And I just don't see all these amazing new markets across the globe. You know, the United States has New York that uh, um, it's changed many of the laws that drove a lot of its activity offshore. China is going to want to keep control. Uh, uh, um, yeah, India wants to build up Mumbai. I mean, I just I, I, the, the idea that there's 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 a zillion easy pickings to replace the EU, I think, is uh, strange. Thank you. Eve, welcome to this panel. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I, I work between uh, Brussels and, and Washington, and I, I certainly feel that uh, no one's really interested very much in Brexit anymore. Um, but, but we Brits obviously uh, continue to need to talk about it, but um, you know it's worn a bit thin with others. So thank you very much for joining us um, as we uh, try not to contemplate our neighbours. But you, you know, perhaps you, you could share a perspective um, the perspective that you wanted to share that that throws light on on how we feel about things and how we're seeing things from from outside of the UK because I think uh, that's something we always absolutely do need to have. Over to you, Eve. Eve Latel? No, we don't have Eve. I'm uh, so I'm just going to check who we do have. We have, um, so is it, uh, do we have uh, Frankie? Uh, P. Froggy? Anyway, okay, so the gentleman with the really nice tie and the superb shirt, that will have to do. So I'm uh, going to pass over to you with apologies for not uh, getting your name right, but that does come with the territory. So. Uh, you may not even have an outside perspective, you may have an entirely British perspective to give us as well. So that would be a, um, I, I suppose I'm the only person here wearing a tie, so that must be me. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Andres Velasco. I'm the Dean of School of Public Policy at the London School of Economics. I may, be, I may be the single non-British perspective <laughs> of this group, even though I live in the UK and I'm speaking to you from London. Uh, I am originally from Chile. I grew up in Algeria. I was educated in the United States. Um, uh, and I've um, spent much of my life all over the place, but I'm very happy and very proud to be uh, an academic in the UK today. I thought as a resident non-Britain on this panel, I would try to address the question, what in the world does it mean for Britain to be a global nation? What, what, what is global Britain? What might it look like in the eyes of the world? And it occurred to me that uh, there were ways of, of beginning that conversation uh, than simply by reflecting the institution that pays my salary every month. Um, uh, I am a professor at a British university, which is started back in 1895. It's a very, very, very English institution. Uh, nonetheless, in that institution, 77% uh, of students come from outside the United Kingdom. I am the um, dean of the School of Public Policy, where over 90% of the students come from outside the United Kingdom. The LSE has a director who was born in Egypt. 
a, fin a chief financial officer who was born in Germany and a dean myself who was born in Chile. Um, uh, so I think of this as, you know, not a bad emblem for global Britain. Uh, I ask my students often, I have students from 47 countries, including every country that is on the rise economically and financially in the world. We have lots of students from India and Pakistan and China and South Africa and Nigeria, Russia, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Indonesia, Malaysia, pretty much every country that is likely to pay, play a leading role in world trade and world politics and world finance in the next few decades. Why have you come to the UK? Um, why here? Why not the US? Why not Paris? Why not Beijing? Uh, why not some other place? And I think the answers are, are, are in fact quite consistent. First of all, admiration for um, British democracy. Uh, I think that uh, our biggest recruitment officer uh, uh, has been Donald Trump. People who might have gone to the US uh, for a number of reasons, don't find the U.S. very attractive today, and they find you, uh, you know, U.K. democracy and U.K. public life more appealing, more diverse, more liberal in every sense of the word than than the U.S. That's a very big draw. Secondly, my students are likely to say because I grew up reading the Economist and the Financial Times. Um, I used to be a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard, uh, and my boss back then was a man who invented the concept of soft power. He was always calling on the U.S. to deploy its soft power around the world. I think the U.K. has gigantic amounts of soft power, um, which uh, it has deployed historically, but maybe it is forgetting how to do that nowadays. Um, you know, the pull not simply of the English language, but of English culture, English politics, uh, English literature, and certainly uh, English democracy, British democracy, are very much of a pull. Thirdly, you know, London remains to a, a, a place where people want to get work experience. A lot of my students would like to spend a year or two or three working at, and, you know, in British government or the city of London or business or culture or an NGO. That is to say, this remains a country with very, very high professional standards where people are keen to get experience, the kind of experience that they might take back home. Things that worry my students, things that might be uh, blocks uh, in the way of Britain becoming a, a global soft power. People worry a lot about the decay and the quality of the political debate in the United Kingdom. Um, I had more than one student say to me, you know, I came to the UK to be trained as an expert. And when I got here, uh, a very senior British minister was telling the world that Britons are tired of experts. They're tired of expertise. They're tired of knowledge. And, you know, we're supposed to be training them in a program that uh, is very keen on evidence-trained policies, on, you know, a reasoned debate of the facts and of the numbers. And I hope I don't really offend everyone if I say that, uh, you know, the Brexit debate was not very big on facts, not very big on numbers, and not very big on reason. One last thought. In a previous life, I was a trade negotiator. Uh, I was very involved in the North American Free Trade Agreement, involved in APEC. Um, you know, the UK is hoping to join the North American Free Trade Agreement. It is to, hoping to join the TPP-11 Agreement in the Pacific and a number of others. I think those are good ideas, but as somebody who used to spend a lot of time negotiating these things, let me just warn you, those are big, messy, complicated agreements. Joining takes a very long time. Getting trade going within them takes an even longer time. Businesses have to get used to the rules. The rules are very different than the rules in the EU. And as a result, I would expect no quick wins from that. But um, to go back to the theme of my very brief remarks, you know, I think the LSE is not a bad example for what a global Britain could look like. Uh, and that future, to me at least, is a very bright future indeed. Thank you, Andres. That was uh, very interesting and useful. Um, I'm going to go to Hugo first and then Sir Peter after that, if I may. So, uh, Hugo, if you would care to share some thoughts with us. Thank you. You, you. Your opening question was, how did we get here? I presume I mean, rather than an existential question, that was how do we get onto this panel? And 
certainly <laughs> I was asked by Mohammed Amersi and I found it's much easier to say yes to Mohammed than no, uh, which is why I'm here. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, I was uh, in government, uh, like Susan, a uh, different party, Conservative Party. I was an MP from 2001 to 2019. And uh, under the Cameron-led government, I was, first of all, the Minister of State uh, in Northern Ireland, then for four and a half years at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, or as we must now learn to love and call it the Foreign uh, and Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, I think it's worth just thinking, and when I was talking to Mohammed about what sort of discussions we might have, I'm all for looking forward and drawing the line. But I think it is just worth perhaps marking ourselves as to where we are in the cycle um, post the Brexit argument. And I have to say, being in government at the time, it was an absolutely hideous time. It was one I would not wish to see again. It caused huge divisions between uh, families, friends, political colleagues. And I think the nearest equivalent probably was to the disagreement in the build up to the Second World War in the late 30s over those who were appeasers and those who were uh, pro rearmament and the divisions that those caused. But I'm, I'm not sure really that some of the arguments have gone away. And I'm also not sure whether to be a, a second uh, vote now, which there will not be and was, of course, argued for many, uh, many argued that there should be. That the, the, the vote wouldn't be largely the same. I mean, I think I divide the reasons that people voted for Brexit into three categories, really. One is emotional. Um, I think the left behind, as it were, uh, felt very disconnected from the prosperity enjoyed in different parts of the country, at least in London and the southeast. And uh, I think there was a real underestimate of uh, how they felt suffered, how they felt quite threatened in some of their communities, not least in uh, the east of England, where there are a lot of... Um, people involved in the agricultural sector from uh, from different parts of Europe and they felt their communities were changing very fast in a way they didn't recognise. And I think that's led into what we saw at the last election when you saw a whole swathe of former Labour seats uh, becoming conservative in what we call the Red Wall um, because those people felt that their communities had been neglected and left behind. I don't think it was a straight binary Brexit remain vote at the last election. The second um, area I would say is constitutional and, and legal, uh, a sense in the UK that there was an ever-increasing union. We were already different, not being the euro, Schengen and so forth. Uh, and if you look at the EU today and you still hear what Macron is saying and what Merkel is saying in the dying days of her leadership, there's still a sort of disconnect between what those euro federalists are saying and what other people I think within Europe are saying. And I think the British people didn't like rightly or wrongly, the perception that they were getting le having less and less control over their rules and, and their destiny. And then there was the, the naked politics of the whole thing, which Susan would recognise. Don't forget, in 2010, the Conservatives were uh, it, it, the dominant party in a coalition with the Liberal Democrats. And there was a real feeling between about 2011, 2012, thereon, that it was going to be very difficult for the Tories to get a majority at the forthcoming general election. We had the Scottish referendum, which I think emboldened David Cameron in his thinking. And there was a head of steam building up for a referendum, frankly, uh, not least because the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, was doing exceptionally well. And there was a real fear that, that, that there would be a, a, a loss at the 2015 uh, election and the determination to get a Tory majority. Now, I, I was one of those people who fall into the category he would say that, wouldn't he? But I was what I call a Eurosceptic. Uh, Remainer. On balance, uh, I voted to uh, remain uh, in the EU. And I did that really for three reasons. And I think those three reasons still hold true today. The first was, I thought, and this is, may sound a bit uh, arrogant, but the British brick from the EU wall would certainly cause it to wobble, uh, not to fall over. For many of the things, reasons um, that uh, we know uh, the British brought a certain um, dimension to the EU. Perhaps it was our cynicism about the project, but certainly in terms of budgetary control and controlling some of the more outre ideas of what the EU should be about. I think the UK was a very uh, positive force within the EU. Everything I've seen since then believes me that I was right. I think the EU is now immeasurably weaker without the UK. The second reason uh, I asked myself who I thought would benefit the most from a weakened EU. 
And that was Russia, to my way of thinking, and uh, certainly the nervousness in the Baltic states and so forth. And I don't think that's changed. In fact, I see in this latest review that Russia is now considered to be the greatest present threat to the United Kingdom. So I, I think they have probably been, in, Putin has probably been emboldened by seeing quite how weak and, and divided Europe uh, now is. And the third reason, which probably gave me the biggest headache of all and continues to do so, having experienced it in my time as a Northern Ireland minister, was how you would treat Northern Ireland. And I see in the last uh, few days, the EU have launched a, a, a case against the UK for a breach of the Northern Ireland protocol in terms of um, the UK deciding in rather an arbitrary way we will extend uh, the period until the 1st of October, uh, which is in contravention to, I believe, what was agreed. And my fears for Northern Ireland uh, is I don't fear a border pearl, um, which is part of the Good Friday Agreement anyway. But what I, what I do think people have neglected for years in Northern Ireland is always to talk about what Dublin want and what the nationalists want and what Sinn Féin want. I, I spent a lot of time with the disaffected loyalist communities, um, you know, the people who'd been connected with the uh, UVF and the other paramilitary organisations. And, and these are people who during the Good Friday Agreement, was sold a story that their lives were going to get immeasurably better, that the union was going to serve, and they're not very trusting of the British government, and they're certainly not very trusting of conservative British governments. And I have to say those people are the people I'm most concerned about, because I really do believe that they are now feeling that their future is being sold down again by the British government, and I... Uh, you know, we've had peace in Northern Ireland. We're used to peace in Northern Ireland. It wouldn't take much to tilt it back into a period where none of us want to see uh, again. All that having been said, uh, the reasons I voted to remain, I was absolutely determined once the British people did vote, and we can argue, if you really want to reopen those arguments about who said what and uh, who lied and who, who told mistruths, but I was absolutely determined when we had the biggest democratic expression this country's ever seen in that vote, that we should abide by what people voted for. And I found it extraordinarily difficult and very regrettable that some of my colleagues in my own party were so hell-bent on overturning the result of that, uh, of that referendum. And they dress it up in all kinds of matters of principle about um, you know, people didn't know what they're being told and the generations were dying and the younger people didn't want it. You can argue it whichever way you can. Truth of the matter is people, British people did have a pretty good idea of what they were voting for. They voted in a significant majority uh, to leave the EU. And if you're a Democrat, you, you put something to the vote, people vote, you abide by the result of that vote. So uh, I would now vote the same, I would now vote, to come, we're not going to have a vote, it's irrelevant how I would vote. But, I mean, I do think that we should move and get on with it. People voted to leave the EU. And uh, I do not share, I do not share the pessimism surrounding our Brexit, uh, I think we've done it at an extraordinarily difficult time with all the uh, competing nightmare uh, created by COVID. Um, and I think Liz Truss is doing a great job. We are striking up good trade deals. I'm not going to bang on about the Commonwealth. I will if I'm given an opportunity in a minute. But my glass is, 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 is certainly half full, not half empty. Thank you, Hugo. And, and Mohammed, it's Jeffries here. I was uh, deputised to... Uh, stand in your shoes momentarily and, and where we've got to is I'm just about to hand over to Sir Peter uh, for his remarks and then I, I, I've come up in, uh, in, in the rear and then uh, I don't know whether you'd like to uh, assume the chair again but that's where we've got to. Sure, um, thank you very much all of you. Um, we had enormous technical difficulties for whatever reason through a laptop, desktop, whatever um, to join in and that's why I'm late. Uh, no excuse, but um, Frank and I were on phone trying to fix it and finally we managed to fix it. So um, Sir Hugo has spoken. Um, my introductory remarks would have said that, um, that the first Brexit happened not uh, very recently. The first Brexit happened 8,000 years ago when through geopolitical, uh, geostrategic forces we broke away from mainland Europe. So what we are now looking at is the is the second Brexit rather than the first one. The second point I would make is that most of the people on this panel, I think, have got remain leanings. So I will try and argue the case in two minutes for um, uh, Brexit. OK, and I remember I was a lawyer and we were studying initially the law of the EEC, as it used to be called, the European Economic Community 
which seemed a great uh, initiative. We joined, as you know, in 1973 or 72, after 50, when it was set up in 57 as the European Coal and Steel Community. And slowly what has been happening is a Franco-German um, initiative to try to politicize this organization so that where it started off life as a economic union, it's now starting to look like the United States of Europe as opposed to a Europe of the United States. And so I ask myself the question as to, had we then known in 72 that this is the direction of travel of Europe, would we still have been able to join? And um, Frank was very keen that we should not look at the past, we should look at the future. And the key question I guess I would have is, do we feel here that Europe can stay intact in the way it is, or in 10 years' time, do you see that it will be a two-tier membership, one tier where people will want to be completely united, and another tier which will be an economic union only, and maybe that's the chance for us to come back in and be part of the economic union. Should we pass on to Sir Peter, and then I, I might yeah. come behind, and then we can... So, Sir Peter, the question for you was, um, uh, you are a consummate diplomat, You've written a book, they call it Diplomacy, one of the finest diplomats um, in, in the establishment. Uh, why did it take four years? And in your view, was there a complete breakdown in diplomacy in the way we negotiated the Brexit and the challenges that we are facing now? Oh, well, that's quite a different question to what I was about to say, but I can... Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, uh, okay, well, um, thanks for having me and thanks to others on the call. I was a diplomat. I ended up being British ambassador to Turkey, to France, and to the United States before I retired about five years ago. And now I do some think tank work and I sit on a number of boards. So, um, uh, and, and I used to have the honor of serving Sir Hugo when I was an official on the foreign <laughs> office. Like, he was the other way around. <laughs> he was one of the ministers. Um, you know, when you go last, you're, the problem is you've got is that you know, everybody said everything, but not everybody has said it. And so I'll try not to cover what others have said too much. And, Mohammed, look at your question. But, I mean, listening to the others, a, a couple of comments, and then let me try and say something about those four years. Um, I mean, first of all, we're not all looking backwards. Um, but I think there's two main reasons why we ended up with Brexit. One was that the United Kingdom wasn't there at the beginning. Uh, and a new club was set up with rules over which we had minimal influence. And we sure. couldn't quite work out whether we were still a great power or a European power. And we had this false idea that we had to choose between Europe and the United States, which I think was a mistake. And we had an obsession about sovereignty, which seems to still be alive and kicking, even though we are in many respects, take, for example, our nuclear deterrent, a good deal less independent and sovereign than France is, because we, are, we took a decision. degree of sovereignty in some of the marvelous international organizations in which the United Kingdom plays a major role, whether it's the permanent membership of the Security Council of the United Nations, or whether it's in, the, in the NATO, or whether it's in the ECFR, or whatever it happens to be, or, or the uh, Convention on Human Rights. There are lots of different ways in which we pool a degree of sovereignty, and which in many ways uh, magnifies the impact we can have rather than diminishes that impact. So I think you know, as Hugo was saying earlier on, you know, there were all sorts of different arguments thrown around. Many of them, I thought, were uh, somewhat dishonest. And uh, I would take issue, not to take issue, I would just give a slightly different take to what he was saying over the verdict. Um, I totally understand that... The whoever's making that noise, perhaps they could mute their microphone. Um, when a, a vote has been taken, uh, even if it's only... 37% uh, of the population of, of, of the electorate that votes for it, you know, democracy means you have to respect it. But I actually think that when you're taking a vote of such extraordinary significance for a country as determining whether or not you stick in the European Union, we ought to have thought about it in advance and probably taken a leaf out of some of the Europeans' book and said, well, if we're going to do something as important as that, you've got to have at least 50% or even two-thirds, uh, as if you were changing the constitution in a country that has a constitution, which, of course, we don't. But so I think it was a, a, a somewhat clumsy, uh, even possibly irresponsible way of altering the future destiny of our country and weakening, in my judgment, the European Union. I flattered myself 
with the thought that the United Kingdom did make a significant contribution to the EU, and many of the best things that it does uh, were British initiatives, lucky enough. <laughs> and perhaps some of it won't be lost. Perhaps we will find ways of continuing to work, even though we turn down the option of having a structured relationship with the EU on foreign and security policy and defence during those negotiations. I mean, so which brings me very briefly to try to look at Mohammed's uh, question: you know, why was those, those four or five years so difficult, and was it a failure of diplomacy? I think we we probably committed a failure of diplomacy, ending up having to uh, hold the referendum <laughs> which David Cameron had promised in order to keep his party unified, but I think never thought he would have to have the check cashed uh, by the uh, the UKIP people. And then, goodness me, he won that election better than most people expected. Uh, in 2015 and um, in, in 2010, uh, no, in 2015, and had to go ahead with the um, commitment which he had given. And so we ended up uh, with that referendum. But there was a, an attempt to negotiate a better deal with which the then government could go to the British people and say, look, we've decided to give you all a view, a vote, and please decide what you would like. But we think we've actually negotiated an even better terms of membership. So we recommend that to the British people, which is what they did, but actually it wasn't enough. And it, you can argue that during that negotiation, and possibly even before it, more might have been done to strengthen the case for the British people to vote in favour. That said, and I was living in France and then the United States uh, around that time, I was very strongly affected by my French and other friends who said, if, if this vote was taken in our countries, the answer would be no, whatever the question on the order paper is going to be, because people are fed up with life. Uh, and the conditions and the stagnant incomes and the sense of uh, resentment against political elites, which we've had since the, the global financial crisis of 2017-2018, is such that there is an overwhelming desire for change. And, of course, Donald Trump tapped into that, saying that Brexit uh, in the United Kingdom actually helped him getting elected just six months later. We spent four or five years wrapping ourselves around the axle, uh, of the Brexit negotiations. Um, we didn't really know what we wanted. We set a timetable without knowing what the, what the uh, objectives were. Uh, we didn't know if we were going to leave the single market or the customs union. We were, some people in the government were saying we would keep freedom of movement. All that went out the window, and we ended up with a harder form of Brexit than, in my view, the British people were promised. Um, and we ended up, in the end, with a curious withdrawal agreement which was full of contradictions, which Theresa May as Prime Minister felt were not acceptable, but couldn't get through Parliament when she had a different version of the withdrawal agreement. But on the benefit, with the benefit of a large majority, Boris Johnson was able to get through Parliament. But it had some unworkable elements in it, particularly in relation to Northern Ireland. And that is one of the uh, difficulties we have now. So I think the, the problem of those four or five years was that you had... Uh, a very big gap between a broad brush decision taken by a majority of those who cast their vote in the United Kingdom and an un unbelievably difficult negotiation where, <laughs> uniquely, I think, in world history, uh, you were trying to negotiate a free trade agreement uh, from a position of having had a free trade agreement and trying to unnegotiate it and get out of a single market into uh, terms which were less advantageous, but which you were still going to sell as being better than what you had before. So it was a a pretty peculiar process, to be honest. And here we are now with a, an arrangement which was going to be full of deregulation, less red tape, but which has tied our exporters up in God knows how many new regulations and customs forms and seen, as, as the Baroness was just saying, Baroness Kramer, uh, British trade and exports to the European Union collapse in January. Hopefully they'll pick up in February and March. But, you know, we're not actually in great shape. And the free trade agreements, which we are busy negotiating with the rest of the world, um, I'm, I'm full of admiration for Liz Truss in having done that. But none of them give us any better terms of trade than we had before. Um, and none of it makes up for the loss of, of trade that we are going to have from leaving the European Union. I'd love us to have a free trade agreement with the United States, but already America is our biggest single trading partner. Already Britain and America are the biggest foreign investors in each other's economy without a free trade agreement. And if we do end up getting one, it will probably be at the price of an awful lot of agriculture and financial services and other, uh, other uh, requirements, which will make the conditions of trade more rather than uh, rather less difficult. That's without dealing with Buy America legislation and public procurement policies 
and a whole raft of other things which are, are complicated in the United States, but which we managed to get around at the moment. So during those four or five years, we, we eventually got to a conclusion, which was a long way, I think, from where we were in 2016, which leaves us with harder Brexit, as I was saying, than we had initially, with some um, potentially difficult uh, commercial situation. Uh, financial services, one of the sectors with which I'm involved, looking really much weaker uh, than it was beforehand. And therefore, a big challenge for the United Kingdom to try to make that relationship work. A very brave attempt, I think, in the new integrated review published yesterday to show that Britain is going to be a great global power. But a global power has to be underpinned by economic strength, not undermined by economic weakness. So if we're not going to actually be any stronger, uh, then we're not going to be strutting our, uh, strutting our stuff around the world, uh, doing all those wonderful things which are in that review, which, many of which are admirable, but I wonder whether we have the resources and whether on our own, outside the European Union, uh, people are going to pay us uh, the kind of attention that we would like and whether we are going to be as world-beating as the Prime Minister likes to say we are in so many different respects. I think it's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, I hope we can make the relationship with the European Union work well and stop calling each other rude names. I think it's of fundamental importance that on a whole raft of issues, whether it's defence or cyber security or police or law and order, investment, services, lots of other things, you know, that we can work closely with our European partners. But it's going to be difficult and it's going to be more difficult than it looked like it was going to be five years ago. Thank you. Can I welcome Prime Minister Le Terme, who's just joined us from Brussels? Uh, welcome, Prime Minister. Uh, I have a quick question for you. And by the way, I just got a message from Frank that they've extended our session by 15 more minutes, um, should we want to take it up. So the question I have for you is, um, do you believe that Brexit is a one-off phenomena, or do you see that there is going to be, over the next few years, other European countries also wanting to peel off because they say that this bureaucracy really doesn't work for them. And as we have seen recently during the COVID-19 vaccination, if the UK was part of the EU, uh, it would have been much more complicated for us, but we were able to vaccinate 25 million people quite easily here with all the bureaucratic red tapes. That we have. And do you foresee that Europe could then be into a two-tier structure, one where there is countries that want to be politically united and the other tier where they only want to be economically united as it was first seen. Thank you very much and apologies for coming late into this conversation and thank you for having me. Um, to answer your question in a summarized way, uh, what I think now is that um, a separate individual one-off case and there's no spread of uh, anti-European attitude amongst governments and leadership. Um, by the way, people have also seen how difficult it is, as was mentioned by the predecessor pre 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 in speaking, how difficult it is to unfold, to, uh, to try to, uh, well, to get out of the European Union in, in good terms. Um, but to answer your question, I don't think so. I think for the time being, of course, lots of unexpected things can happen. And what is right is, on the one hand, even before COVID, we had already some structural issues with countries from Central and Eastern Europe. Um, secondly, um, history is always speeding up when you have crisis. And we have this very important crisis, which, to be fair, uh, I think is not handled impressively by the European institutions. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we don't have to scapegoat, and, and also national governments have, have, uh, have some flaws and failures. But for the time being, what has been undertaken by the European Union to coordinate, to take up responsibilities, to take initiatives, has not been very convincing. Of course, we have to be aware of the fact that health policy has never been part of what was given to European institutions as competences. Uh, amongst others because of the German issue where health policy is, is mainly a lender, uh, well, it's, it's mainly a competence at the level of the lender. But so to, to continue on trying to get an answer to, to answer your question, I don't think so at the time being, for the time being. Uh, um, 
But of course, as was mentioned, if you would ask now the people, the people in the streets of European towns and cities, what they think about the European Union, what they think about bureaucracy, what they think about politics in general, I think you would not be surprised by, you would be surprised how negative these, uh, these feelings would be. The last element, I think, and it has been mentioned also, uh, but having been seated around the table when we were informed by David Cameron about his uh, referendum ID, suddenly, um, I would also like to underline this. It was really a very specific reason. Of what has always very been, let's say, the, the, the interaction and the relation between the member states and the UK has always been difficult. But still, uh, when David Cameron announced that he would uh, ask for a, refer for a referendum, this came as a, as a very negative surprise, and I could not imagine today what heads of maybe maybe there are some risks in, in Eastern Central Europe. But apart from that, I don't see a, a, a major risk of uh, of another example of, uh, of what kind of uh, exit. I think the, the decisions that have been taken recently in terms of the Green Deal, uh, also the multi-annual framework for the budget, so there have been some decisions that have shown that there is unity and there is a capacity also to to be united, to stand united. Um, also, I think the, the final decisions in the case of Brexit were taken unanimously, were taken also in, 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 on, the, on the European Union side in quite a comfortable and easy way. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Jeffrey, has everybody spoken or do we need to call on anyone else that has not spoken before I, I joined? Um, actually, Jeff has been sort of uh, participated yeah, with, with, with me, so I just want to, to just throw in a couple of minutes for that. So we, we have got an extension of time, so I also have a question Velasco, if I may. Professor, you are the Dean of the Public Policy Government School at the LSE. You've got a very um, global view of 